Hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of Alice and myself and Mark over there, and all of the people involved in the ministry of Bible Talk, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, we're so glad that we can meet, even though it's electronically. More, more to come about that. So anyhow, we're, we're, still, we're continuing on in our study of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, the Ephesians. And I want to talk a little bit about where we left off last week. Because last week, or last, the last time we did this, we were in chapter 5, and we looked at verse 17 up to verse 20. So I'm going to want to review, revisit a couple of the verses in there. Uh, but before we do that, I'm just going to say this. Father, we just praise you and thank you. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who was led, sent to lead us into all truth. Lord, we need that leading. We need your guidance, Lord God. We need your word. So we praise you and thank you, Lord, that you have given your word to us in abundance. Lord, help us to be focused on your word. Help us to live in your word, to live your word. In Jesus' name, Father, I pray. Thank you. Hallelujah. All right, so as I said, last, our, our last study, we are in Ephesians chapter 5. And I just want to revisit these two verses. In verse 17, it said, So then don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Ephesians 5, 17. And then in verse 5, 20, it says, Always giving thanks for all things, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Well, since we did that, there has been an explosion here in the United States of this coronavirus. Now, it was taking place in the rest of the world, but it's just been in the last few weeks that it's really taken off in the United States. So I want to ask you this question. Do you understand what's going on? Do you understand what the will of God is? Want to write that down? Okay. <laughs> the other thing is, part of that is, are you giving thanks for all things? Are you giving thanks for the coronavirus? What? Absolutely. Well, are you a Bible believer? I mean, that's what, this is what the Word of God says. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And you know, that is the will of the Father. It says Paul wrote that in the church at Thessalonians. He said that we are to give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. That's the will of God in all things. So it's easy for you to give thanks in the things that you see as being good things. But what about now? What about in the midst of this epidemic and it is a global pandemic? Right. And bear in mind that it's global, all right? That's very important in this study. Are you giving thanks? And you can look at me and say, what are you, nuts? No, I have a sound mind. I have the mind of Jesus Christ. But the word of God says I'm to give thanks in all things. I'm to give thanks for all things. I believe the Bible. And I believe the Bible is not a book of suggestions. I believe that the Bible is a book of commands. And we'll talk more about that, I promise you. So if God has commanded me to give thanks for all things, the coronavirus and this epidemic that's going on is one of those for all things. Have you given thanks for it? Have you considered this? Are you considering it now that I said it? Are you a Bible-believing Christian? You know, our website, when we do these videos, I always post it, it's on In Search of Christianity. And In Search of Christianity uh, says that we are seeking true faith in these perilous last days. Seeking true faith in these perilous last days. What's true faith? It's believing the Word of God. Now, I, I, I'm going to, I pray that you don't think that I'm being judgmental. Well, you know what? I don't really care. I'm just going to say what's true, and you deal with it. The fact of the matter is that I have said for years now 
that in our travels, and if you know us, we have traveled many, 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 many places to many, many, many churches, many different denominations in many different parts of the world. And I said, one of the hardest things that I find to find in a Bible-believing church is a Bible-believing Christian. Oh, yeah, they believe the parts they like. It's easy to believe the things that are nice. It's easy to believe the things. That... What about the things that you don't like? I don't expect you to like the coronavirus. But God says, give thanks for it. Why? Well, we'll, we'll talk about that. Remember that when Jesus was talking about the elect, his own people, he said, when the Son of Man returns, when he comes, will he find faith on earth? That's Luke 18, 8. Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, his question is, will he find faith when he returns? Will he find true faith? What's true faith? Well, I'm not going to give you my opinion, but the Word of God says this. Now, faith is the assurance, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval. By the way, that word approval in the Greek is martyrea. It's a good witness. Will he find a good witness? That we, you know, we gain a good witness. You, you know, we like to talk about being a witness. Do you like to talk about being a martyr? That's what the Greek word means. Okay. Faith operates this way. Let's just talk about this a minute. And I'm sure, listen, this may be very basic to you, but the simple fact is, let's take a look at it. Faith operates this way. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Romans 10, 9, and 10. I'm going to use my little notes here, because I've been busy at it while I've been praying today. If I was able to separate them. Okay. But the scripture shows because you've got to confess it with your mouth. You've got to believe it in your heart. You have to confess it with your mouth. But Scripture makes it clear that it's possible, and all too often the case, to say that you have faith when, in fact, you do not. As Jesus said, Matthew 15, verses 7 through 9, I'm going to read. You hypocrites, rightly did the Isaiah prophesy of you. This people honors me with their lips. But their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. You know, you, you can say that you have faith. But do you? Where's the evidence of it? That's likely the motivation for James to write, Even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, You have faith. I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. James 2, 17 and 18. Faith is the evidence, but faith has to have evidence. There has to be evidence that you really are walking in that faith that you claim to have. Are you a Bible believer? I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say this, most are not. It's one thing to say it because you like this verse and that verse and that. But being a Bible believer means you believe the Bible, let's say, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. You can't pick and choose the parts you want to believe. You can't chicken, pick and choose the parts you like. You have to believe the Word of God. Do you believe that God is in control? I mean, look at what's going on in the world around us right now. Do you believe that God is in control? Absolutely. Do you? Absolutely. I'm going to give you a reason to. And I'm going to read to you from Job, okay. starting in verse chapter 12, verse 7. Think about this, please. But now ask the beasts, and let them teach you. And the birds of the heavens, let them tell you. Or speak to the earth, and let it teach you. And let the fish of the sea declare to you. Who among 
all of these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this. In whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Does not the ear test words as the palate tastes its food? Wisdom is with aged men, with long life is understanding. With him are wisdom and might, to him belong counsel and understanding. Behold, he tears down and it cannot be rebuilt. He imprisons a man and there can be no release. Behold, he restrains the waters and they dry up and he sends them out and they inundate the earth. With him are strength and sound wisdom. The misled and the misleader belong to him. He makes counselors walk barefoot. He makes fools of judges. He loosens the bonds of kings and binds their loins with a girdle. He makes priests walk barefoot and overthrows the secure ones. He deprives the trusted ones of speech and takes away the discernment of the elders. He pours contempt on nobles and loosens the belt of the strong. He reveals mysteries from the darkness and brings the deep darkness into light. He makes the nations great, then destroys them. He enlarges the nations, then leads them away. So Jesus, the Son of Man, when he returns, will seek to find faith by testing. Not by asking if you go to church on Sunday or if you're a member of the right denomination or do you think his favorite denomination is. He's going to test your faith to see if it's actual and real. Here in the United States, now Alice and I just returned from a, we were over, we were out of the country for mm -hmm. a couple of weeks. And as we were, that's when the coronavirus in the United States just went soon from here to there while we were gone. And um, we had access to, to one news channel while we were out, and that was CNN. Now, you may think it's biased or whatever you may think, but I just it, it doesn't matter because what I want to read to you is something that Donald Trump said. And he said it, so it's on all of the, the uh, news stations. When he was doing a coronavirus ta task force and, and press briefing, remember he was doing that every day, he probably still is, right? Mm -hmm. On Thursday, March 19th, he said this, talking about the coronavirus, he said, this is something that happened. There was, some people would say, an act of God. I don't view it as an act of God. I would view it as something that just surprised the whole world. Now, now, let me just say something. And I say this to all of you who are really involved in politics. We have a representative form of government here in the United States of America. Donald Trump, the president, represents the people of the United States of America. So he stands and says to the people of America and to the world that he does not believe that this is an act of God. He's wrong. He's absolutely wrong. How will the Lord know if you and I have faith? God will act, and it will be no surprise to me. Donald Trump said that this took us by surprise. Well, did it take you by surprise? Are you a Bible believer? Do you know the Bible? Because here's what the Word of God says. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. First Peter 4. I mean, this is written 30, uh, 2,000 years ago. God is warning us. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that comes upon you for your testing. When this global pandemic hit and the scope of it became evident, who did you place your trust in? Who were you looking to? Be honest with yourself. I mean, listen, you don't owe me an answer, but you owe yourself an answer. The first answer that the world had for protection was social distancing. I mean, this was a term that I had never heard before. Now, I'm 76 years old. I never heard this term social distancing before. Have you heard the word? No. This is all new stuff they're making up. Absolutely. Social distancing. Don't get together. Stay, uh, stay distant apart from each other. Separate. Separate. That's sound wisdom. 
uh, worldly wisdom, mm -hmm. yes. earthly wisdom, natural wisdom. Should I say demonic wisdom? Because that's, that's what the, the word of God says. Yeah, that's what worldly wisdom is. Earthly, natural, and demonic. That's worldly wisdom, and it's a challenge to our, it's a challenge to our faith. Mm -hmm. The danger is this. The Lord gave us wisdom from above mm -hmm. and commanded, not suggested. Jesus Christ is a master. He is not a mentor. Masters give commands. Mentors make suggestions. Shame on all of you churches that have put aside the word disciple and started to just make mentor mm -hmm. from Greek mythology. But that's another story. Stay away from each other. But the word of God says this. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Hebrews 10, 25. Particularly in this day and age, we need to gather. We need to come together. Behold how pleasant and becoming it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. You know, I, I'm writing a book. I've been writing it for quite some time. I still have, I mean, if you want to see it, you can just email me and I'll send you what I have. But I talk about three things that are the primary attacks of the devil on the church. And they are division, distraction, and disarmament. And not without cause that I put this, uh, what are you going to say? Division <clears throat> among them. Because Jesus said a house divided cannot stand. Mm -hmm. Satan knows that. So he's, he's trying to get us divided. There is so much importance in our gathering together. Two are better than one for their labor. A three-stranded cord is not easily broken. As iron sharpens iron, so I mean, I mean there are, the Bible is filled with verses that talk about the importance of our being together and interacting with one another. So the world is telling us now, whatever you do, don't get together. But the word of God is commanding. Remember, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus is commanding that you forsake not the assembling together of yourselves. And knowing that the world is in the power of the evil one, that that makes so much sense. Okay. So who That's will, what the instruction from the world would be. So who, who will you trust? Yeah. Who will you follow? Is this the test? I mean, that's pretty clear cut if you stop and think about it. And I pray you stop and think about it. The world is saying us to us to us right now, don't get together. The word of God says, don't forsake getting together. In this time. In this time, particularly in this time. Mm -hmm. Is is that the test? Are you going to, are you going to obey the world or are you going to obey the word? I, I, that's a question you have to ask, answer for yourself. I, you know, you may ask me, I mean, many have. Don't you understand? We'll die. <laughs> really? I mean, people say, if I talk to people, I just say, don't, don't you get it? Don't you understand? When we get together, we're, we're going to die. Now, if you're a believer, you won't. Because if you're a believer, you can't. What do you have? Oh, your body can. Your flesh can cease to, to, to exist and function. But you can't die. You can't die. Well, one of the reasons is that you already have. For when you were born again, when you were saved, when you accepted Jesus Christ, the Word of God says that you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and in God. That's why Jesus said you must be dead. Because when you die, if you want to live again, you have to be born again. So if it's appointed unto man to die once and then the judgment, mm -hmm. and you've died that once, ta-da! It says in 1 Corinthians 15, I'm going to read verses 54 and 55. But when this perishable, that's this, will have put on the imperishable, and the mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Death has been conquered. You know, when Jesus went to Bethany, he heard that his friend Lazarus had, had died, right? Mm -hmm. So he goes to, well, first thing he does is he waits. Yes. To make sure that 
Lazarus is good and dead. Four days dead. Stinking dead in the tomb. So he goes there and he encounters Lazarus' sister, Martha, on the way. And she's mourning, right? And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And he said to her, do you believe this? That's John 11, 25 and 26. So the question becomes, do you believe this? Do you believe the word of God? That's what faith is all about, is believing the word of God. It's not about, you know, we come up with programs and things. and No, it's about the word of God. And if you die in the natural, well, how terrible. That's terrible, right? Somebody's saying no. <laughs> the word of God says to live is Christ, to die is gain. Why are you so afraid of death? Why, why, why does death in the natural have any hold on you whatsoever? It's been conquered. Yeah. We're to have the same attitude in us that was in Christ Jesus. But Paul said, be an imitator of me as I imitate Jesus. To live as Christ and die is gain. What are you afraid of? The real question now, my Bible-believing brothers and sisters, do you believe this? That's the real question. Do you trust in Jesus, the Word made flesh who dwelt among us? Do you have faith? I'm not talking about, you know, do you go to church on Sundays? I'm not talking about do you tithe? I'm, not, I'm talking about do you believe the Word of God? Do you believe that the Word of God is true and you can count on it and you must be living it? That's between you and, you know, yeah, yeah you could die. You're going to. You are. You're all going to die. It's appointed on the man to die. Okay? Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Young men who went into captivity, right? Mm -hmm. From Israel, from Jerusalem, into Babylon. And because they were faithful, they were full of faith. Mm -hmm. And they would only obey the word of God. When Nebuchadnezzar, the king, said, you have to bow down before the statue and worship me, they refused. He said, well, you're going to die. Then Nebuchadnezzar, when he heard this, in a rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then these men were brought before the king. Do you know this? Yeah, I'm sure you know the, the account, right? You know the account of this event. They took them because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they could die. So, well, well, maybe God will deliver us. Or maybe he won't, but he's still God. They trusted him. They trusted him. So they were literally taken and thrown into a furnace that had been purposely made hotter than ever. They burned up the people. Burned up the people and thrown them in the furnace. And when they got into the furnace, do you know this account? Do you know the word of God? Mm -hmm. It says that the three of them went into the thing and four of them walked around. Hallelujah. At what point did they throw Jesus into the furnace? Mm -hmm. They didn't. He was in there waiting. That's right. He was in there waiting. Don't you know that the word of God says... That he will go before you. He knew where they were going to be. He knew where they were going to be. They had a party in that furnace. Yeah. That's a testimony that has lived for thousands of years. Because they trusted in God's promise. Yeah. Jesus was waiting for them in the fire. Jesus is going before you. No matter what. He will not leave you nor forsake you. He will not fail you. Mm -hmm. Is CNN or Fox News or the BBC or any other news source explaining to you what's going on. They don't know what's going on. They don't have a clue. They really don't. If you believe the word, you know that to be true. You know it has to be true because it's written. And you believe what's written, right? But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things. 
yet he himself is appraised by no one. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15. They can't appraise things spiritually. They're natural men. They can't accept the things of the Spirit of God. And I'm telling you, this is all about what God is doing. Do you understand? Do you understand? And let me just say this. There's a difference between understanding and revelation. I hear Christians all the time saying, well, you know, God gave me revelation. No, God didn't. Give, God gave, God, the Bible is revelation from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. It's all been revealed. It's all been revealed. Now, there are going to be things happen at the very end of the time. It'll be revelation, new revelation. But otherwise, everything's been revealed. What happens is you get a flash of understanding. That's why it says over and over in the book of Proverbs, search and seek for understanding. You got to understand what's going on. So when, when God was removing Saul as being king over Israel, now remember, he became king in Israel because the people wanted a, they wanted a king who would make the people of God like the people of the world. And if you're honest with yourself, you're going to look around and you're going to say, well, gee, the people of God today look an awful lot like the people of the world. But how long do you think God would put up with that? So what he did is God caused Saul to be killed by the Philistines. Go read it. Study the Bible. It was God that killed Saul. Why? So that he could be replaced by a man after God's own heart, David. Right? And David became king. It talks about in 1 Chronicles 12. It talks about that event. And it talks about the fact that while, while David was arising as the new king of Israel, his mighty men gathered to him to support him. And it goes through. I mean, go read 1 Chronicles 12. Read from 11 and 12 and into 13, and you'll see. This tribe, this family, these people supported David. But no one in particular, because God noted this one in particular. First Chronicles 12, verse 32 says, Of the sons of Issachar, men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. Right? This one particular group, God said, you know what? They understood the times. And they had knowledge of what, their, what Israel, the people of God, should do. The question is, do you understand what's going on in these times? If you don't, ask God. Seek understanding. Over and over it says that in the book of Proverbs. Seek understanding. You see, Jesus expects that we too would understand the times. He expects us to understand the times. That should be clear if you know the Bible and you're a Bible-believing Christian. Let me read you this from Matthew 16, verses 2 and 3. He replied to them, he was talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees, he replied to them, when it's evening, you say it'll be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, there'll be a storm today for the sky is red and threatened. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? Can you discern the signs of the times? You realize that these things that are going on are signs of the times. They're not random happenings. They are signs of the times. This is God at work. Now, a church that has forgotten the fear of the Lord and the word of the cross, they would not find it difficult to see God's hand in the daily news today. Are they, I'm, I'm sorry, they, would they? they wouldn't see God's hand. No, they wouldn't be able to. Because they don't think God will do that kind of thing. No. He's not an angry God, according to them. We, not long ago, here on the interstate highway, right mm -hmm. by where we live, there was a great big billboard and it said, God's not mad. God's not mad at you. God, no, it's, God's not angry. God's not angry. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as, as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. 
for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. God is at work. And he is working his will and his pleasure. It's about God. We, we seem to have forgotten it. I mean, everybody knows Psalm 23. Do you know when it says, he will lead us in paths of righteousness. Hallelujah. For his name's sake. It's about him. Okay, let me go back to Job for a minute. He was, he was a, a man blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. That's what it says in the first, first verse of that book. God allowed, <coughs> God inspired Satan to attack Job. And when he did, and you know the trials of Job, Job's wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Job 2, 9 and 10. Do you not know that God does things that look adverse to us? Is it, would it be a shock to you to think that God could be bringing this coronavirus on the, the world for the testing of our faith? Pray about it. Seek God. Because I'm telling you, if you don't believe that, you need to get closer to the Lord. Well, it's written. Well, it's that, written. He brought the plagues. He, he did it all. He put the Red Sea in front of them. You've heard a word from somebody who actually Thank believes you. the scriptures and knows them. Oh, that's true. And I'm telling you, it's it's a rare case indeed, because most oh yeah, they have lots of favorite verses, but do you ever notice that all of your favorite verses are things that are about God doing good for you? How about you doing good for God? How about you just putting yourselves in the hands of a loving and living God and saying, I'm yours, do as you will. Everything God does is good. Shall we accept good from God and not accept adversity? In Hebrews 10, 20, I'm going to start at verse 22. It says, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking the assembling together of ourselves, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's not a, that's not a suggestion. It's not an encouragement. It is a command of God. And I'm going to tell you one thing that Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commandments. What about the Red Sea? I mean, talk about dangerous situations. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that you know the story, the account of the Red Sea. If you haven't, go read it, please. Because here, God has delivered his people from the captivity, from the, from the abominable captivity of the Egyptians. And he delivered. How did he do that? With his mighty hand, bringing plagues and destruction upon Egypt. And then he takes the people of God and Moses is leading them out. The promise to go to a land flowing with milk and honey. So they go out and they're being led by God. Column of fire, column of smoke, right? They're being led by God and he leads them straight to the Red Sea. An impassable, impossible barrier between them and the promise. Is it not? Well, the people of God certainly thought, thought that it was because they immediately began to complain and grumble and be bitter about the whole thing. They said, oh, we should have never left. We should go back. That was all the handiwork of God. I mean, God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. God set the people free. God led them by a column, right? Of smoke. God, God built the Red Sea. Yes, he did. And he led them right there. That's he, they were exactly where he wanted them to be. Now, the people of God who had seen the power of God in Egypt, the way we, we ways we've never seen, yeah, all right? right? So. 
They could not imagine, did not have faith to cross the Red Sea. They didn't. They didn't have faith to cross the Red Sea. I mean, here's this barrier, there's this water. They had to see before they would believe. So, I mean, while they're grumbling and complaining, Moses says to them, stand by and see the salvation of God. And then he's the parts of the water. When they could see, you no, know if you gotta see it, it's not faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and not seen. If you gotta see it, it's not faith. They had to see it before they believe in act. They got to the other side and they sang and they danced and they praised the Lord. Sounds great, right? Have you read the Bible? Psalm 106, you know what God says about that? When they got to the other side, he said they were in rebellion. Why were they in rebellion? Because they did not trust him. They had no faith. They had no faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. They didn't enter the promised land, by the way. Well, you know, if you start to live like this, you know people are going to say you're nuts. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's, it's true. They think it's insane to have that kind of faith in God that you you will not be you'll not be fearful in the face of things like the coronavirus. I shall not be moved. I shall not be moved. I shall not be. I shall not be moved. Fear not. God, God says it, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. You're mine. You're precious in my sight. And I love you. I love you. So anyhow, listen to this verse, okay? I'm reading from 1 Samuel 21. I'm going to read verse 13. So he, this is David, disguised his sanity before them. That's these people at Akish. And acted insanely in their hands. And scribbled on the doors of the gate and let his saliva run down into his beard. They said, this guy is nuts. So they said, get him out of here. Let him go. Well, there's a problem with that. And there's a problem in the translation. And you don't have to be a Hebrew expert. But, you know, you probably got a concordance. If you don't have a concordance, get one. Because what it literally says is that he acted insanely. That's halal. That's what he acted. Halal. You know what that is? Hallelujah. That's the word for praise. He acted with praise. What was he scribbling on the doors? What was he scribbling on the gate? Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. My God saves. They thought he was nuts. I'm going to tell you right now that if you're not, if you don't act fearful, and if you trust in God with all your heart in the midst of all of this disaster going on, people will think you're nuts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a great reputation to have. Where was that? I'm sorry. First Samuel? First Samuel 21. What a great reputation to have. Crazy for Christ. Loony for the Lord. Does that bother you? I want to read to you from Psalm 34. I'm going to turn to Psalm 34. A song of David when he feigned madness before Abimelech. Who drove him away and he departed. So that's the same time that this is talking about, right? This is this is when David, they thought he was nuts, but it says he feigned madness. Well, you know, he wasn't feigning. He wasn't he was being what he was. He was praising God in the midst of it. In Psalm 34, David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. At all times. That means in the good times, it also means in all of the bad times. Have you praised God because of the situation in your life right now? Have you? That's a test of your faith. And God is watching. David said, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. You're going to look nuts. Because it's not the way of the world. The way of the cross is not the way of the world. Jesus went to the cross with a joy set before him. What's going to overcome this? What's going to overcome this trial in your life? The cross, I don't know. I mean, you know, I don't know what God is going to do. I know God is going to deliver us. I don't know how. I don't know if he'll deliver us from it or he'll deliver us through it, but he'll deliver us. If you believe. But I know how to overcome. 
I absolutely know how to overcome. And you might want to write this down if you're concerned about the coronavirus in you. I'm going to tell you how to overcome it right now. Well, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to let the Lord tell you. Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. Revelation 12, 11. They didn't love their life even when they were faced with death. That faith chapter, Hebrews 11. I, you know, I, uh, I hear it preached all the time and I hear it preached without any understanding. It's not about what you can get from God. It's about what you can give to God. By faith, Abraham obeyed. By faith, Moses just gave up all of the blessings and went, decided to follow in the, the, the people of God. And then look at the last group of people in there. All God has to say is that the world wasn't worthy of them. Is your life a testimony? Is your life a testimony to the greatness of God, to the power of God? Most importantly, is your life a testimony to the love of God? Is it? That's a question you really should ask yourself. Are you a witness to the world of God's love? I'm going to close with this, but you need to think about this. This is serious stuff. This is life and death. Are you a Bible-believing Christian? Or are you just a go-to-church-and-have-fun Christian? I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians verse 13, chapter 13, verse 5. Because, you know, I'm telling you that God's going to test you. I'm not the one that sits here to test you. I'm not your judge. But Paul says this. Test yourselves. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. For do you not recognize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? Let a man examine himself. Examine yourself. Are you trusting in the world to deliver you? Or are you trusting in God? Are you fearful or are you faithful? Are you rejoicing or are you complaining and mumbling and groaning and complaining? You need to answer this question because it's becoming more critical by the moment. When Jesus returns, the question is, will he find faith? He's coming back for his own. He's coming back for a people of faith. And Father, I just thank you, Lord God, that you are the author of faith, that you have put your word into our lives, that you have planted that seed of faith in us. Lord God, your word, you sent your son, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Lord, that we would have that example in our lives and have that faith in our lives. Lord, help us to be a blessing to the world in this time of crisis by letting them know that there is an answer. And I'm not talking about the worldly answers. I'm not talking about drugs. I'm not talking about plans. I'm talking about there is a deliverer who is faithful. Are you telling people, trust in God? Are you telling people, God loves you? He will not leave you or forsake you if you turn to him. I praise you and thank you, Father, for your faithfulness in Jesus' name. Well, we'll be back again next time. Next time, same channel, same place. And see, but please, pray about this. And if you have, if you have comments, you want to write to me, write to me at office at BibleBook.com. We love you. I don't love you near as much as the Lord loves you, but I love you, and we pray for you. So until next time, may the Lord our God bless you, build your faith, and use you for the glory of his name. Amen and amen. Bye-bye. Thank Jesus, my Savior, Lord.